Hello and welcome to this section on the care certificate. Now for you to complete the care certificate you'll need to undertake 15 modules in which are downloaded from online. They work in two ways where you have your knowledge workbook to begin with and then down at the bottom you've got some written answers. The aim of these videos is just to help you uh, interpret the, the written material that's there as I know not everyone likes to read and sometimes it's easier for someone to talk you through it. These are independent learning materials so please make sure that you do take the time in to read the workbooks because everything you need to answer the questions are available. So this workbook is standard one and it's all about understanding your role as a carer. So let's just have a look at what you're going to be covering in here. So you need to understand the what, what it is that's required from you. You should have a job description. So when you start working with your company, please make sure that you have your staff handbook, your job descriptions, and that you've had some kind of induction to understand your roles and responsibilities. You should know what's expected of you. So again, have you had some kind of training or shadowing for people to show you what to do? The job description will list all the tasks in which that you're required for. However, it doesn't mean just because it's not on the job description there's not more tasks, uh, because you'll normally find at the bottom of the job description it will state something along the lines of any other reasonable request. But the kind of things that are in your job description are things around like providing care and support. We need to work in a personal centred way and to be able to communicate effectively. That differs from person to person, and as you work through the 15 standards, you'll know that there are differences between being working in a personal sense of way and different types of communication. You'll also cover things around equality and diversity. So whilst you learn these as standalone things, you need to work in a more holistic way. And what that means is you're going to bring all the skills together to help you uh, achieve these standards. You may be required to work as part of a team and at times you'll be going out into the community and you'll be working with other people. Everyone is trained different in health and social care so it's important that you understand the ways in which they work when you work with them. You may have to contribute towards other activities so therefore you'll need to do record keeping, ensuring that you're working in a safe way and you understand what's required of you. Some care services provide apps and you'll do it on your phone and others will provide written documents. It's down to you to find them and read them. Finally, we're going to look around confidentiality and we'll test some of those theories as we go through the training sessions. You do have a duty of care to keep information safe and secure. However, it's important that you don't promise to keep secrets that puts people at risk. There's many, many legislations as we run through this. You don't need to understand them all, you're never going to be an expert. But what you do need to understand is the title and how they apply to you. So it's important we understand those. The care certificate looks at knowledge and competency. So what this does, it gives you the knowledge requirements for you to undertake your role in a safe and an effective manner. The competency side will come through practical skills. So you'll be asked to perform CPR. You'll be asked to demonstrate hand washing. And that way, we'll be able to know that you can do things in a safe manner. As you move on, we'll have other things to look at. So we don't just have legislation, we also have codes of practice and codes of conduct. Now, codes of practice and conduct aren't necessarily legal requirements, they're more ethical practices. So it's about a shared value and concept. So one of your codes of conduct, for example, will be you can't maintain a relationship with a customer. So it's not a law, there's nothing illegal, but it is against a code of practice. Now you can get your code of practice from the website, the Skill to Care website or Skills for Health. And again, it outlines what you can and cannot do. As we work through the care certificate and as with all training in health and social care, we have what's called the six C's. And it's important that we're able to embed those through our normal everyday practice. Competence is one of the six C's, so being, being able to perform your tasks in a safe and effective manner is critical for your health and well-being, but that's for the well-being of others. So let's look at kind of understanding your role and how this applies. 
in life, we all have our own values and our own experiences, and our, our experiences forms who we are as individuals. We may be part of society where we have different belief structures or different religious structures, and that's absolutely fine. They're, they're who, what, and what makes us us. What we must be aware of is that they're ours and nobody else's. And unless somebody asks us, we shouldn't be forcing our values, our beliefs, and our personal feelings onto other people, because they may not share the same values and beliefs as you do, and may be offended. But at no point are we saying you can't have values or beliefs and care. They form a real integral part of what we do. It's about recognising when it's appropriate to share them. So beliefs can be described as things that in life that you feel strongly about, and attitudes look more of approaches and mindsets. So when we are working with people, just be mindful, am I passing on my value and belief, or am I listening to you about what you want? And remember, I may not agree with those people, but that's fine, because they're entitled to their own values and beliefs. Again, looking at values, aims and objectives, it's important for you to understand these as well. Understanding that values do uh, have a strong part within the care system and it enables us to look at what we're doing and how we're doing it. Our aims look at kind of what we're aiming to do as a service, so what's our hopes and goals, what is it we're trying to do while we're here. And our objectives is what are we hoping is going to out, what's going to be the outcome of this. Now in health and social care, we're moving over to a new service called outcome-based care. And what that means for you is, no longer will it be the case of you just providing care for somebody, but there has to be a purpose to it. So for example, it may be I'm providing this care, I'm providing you food and fluid because I'm maintaining your nutrition and dehydration. So it's important we understand why we're doing what we're doing. As we move on, we have roles and responsibilities within the workplace. It's important you understand your roles and your responsibilities. You must not work out your scope of practice and you must be ensured that you're confident and competent in performing your roles. We have other legislation in which the law tells us that we must work in a safe way and that falls under the Health and Safety at Work Act. Meaning, I have a duty of care to be able to provide care in a safe and effective manner. It also places a duty of care on me as a carer that if I'm doing something that I'm not aware of, I should stop and seek guidance and support. You cannot use an excuse that you did not know in social care. The rule of thumb is if you're not aware of how to perform a task, you stop because that's your duty of care uh, to meet the, the 1974 regulations. As we move down, we have the GDPR, the confidentiality agreements, and again around confidentiality, it's important we're aware of how we're handling people's data. That means what we're writing about people in their care plans and what we're saying online. Under no part is it acceptable for you to discuss people outside their homes or put anything on your social media pages. Imagine how you would feel if somebody wrote about you and then you found out at a later date. Equally, when we're writing notes about people, remember they have a right to read what's written about them. So be mindful about what we're writing. If you've had an experience of difficult, sorry, a difficult day with somebody, be mindful how you're going to word that. Don't write things such as they're challenging, they kicked off and they were this or that. Try and word it in a way which explains what happened but, rem but you remove the emotion from the text. It's important that, again, people that only need to see the information see it and we only pass on information on a need to know basis. So let's look at working conditions. So again, for you in domiciliary care, it's quite difficult for us to have a working condition because every single home we go to is different and every home has its own requirements. However, we do have simple things that we should be doing to and from work. So for example, am I reducing infection control as I'm travelling? 
When I get to people's homes, am I aware of what to do in the case of a fire? Would I know how to get out of the building if I went in for the first time? If you need to, talk to your care coordinators to find out further information. We also have the Equality Act 2010, stating that we have protected characteristics such as race, age, colour, creed, and, and uh, etc. It's important that we follow those. We can't ask for respect if we don't give respect. So it's important that we work in a way which protects other people's rights. We have agreed ways of working and they're normally called procedures. So it's important that you go onto your company's website and you download the company's policies and procedures and they're called agreed ways of working. Every single person will have a risk assessment, so it's important you read that risk assessment and they'll have care plans. And it's important you read those because people need changes on a daily basis. So just because it's written doesn't necessarily mean that's going to be the right thing to do at that time because you're in a position where you can see change in people's needs. So it's important that when you go to care, you don't go into care in a task-orientated way, but you go in a way where you're using your eyes and you're able to think about what you're seeing. And if you see a change in need, you're able to report that safely. You have a responsibility to provide care that supports yourself and others. Your needs will change on a daily basis too. You may be unwell, you may feel tired, you may feel fatigued. And again, if you're feeling unwell and fatigued, are you the right person going out providing care on that day? Because the reality is you may make mistakes and you may put other people at risk. So again, have that read of the agreed ways of working within your company's policies and procedures. It's important that we report errors. CQC require us to do what's called notifications. And notifications allow us an opportunity in ways of working. What it means is if you make a mistake, we want you to be open, honest and transparent about this. It gives us an opportunity to learn by those mistakes and it allows us to prevent that mistake happening again. It may be the fact that you've had a near miss and actually that near miss moving forward could be avoided and other people could learn from those. We don't punish people for making errors in care. What we do is we, we learn from them and we do a thing called lessons learned. I want you to be assured that if you do make an error, that if you raise it to your, your, your managers, as long as you're honest about the error, it will be handled within the correct manner. You will not be penalised for making errors. We then have whistleblowing. Whistleblowing it forms part of our safeguarding procedures about keeping people well and works in line, again, with raising errors. If we work in an open, honest and transparent way, we need people to be empowered to whistleblow, report and complain. And from those three processes, we're able to, as a service, make sure that people are not being harmed. If you see anything and you're unsure about anything, you'll be able to follow your whistleblowing policy and procedure that you can download from your company's website. And alternatively, you can ask for the reporting forms in which you can do that. It's important that you're aware of your local policies and procedures because if your service works over two different boroughs, both boroughs may have different, different whistleblowing policies. You will work in partnership with other multidisciplinary people and it's important that we maintain good professional boundaries and good professional respect. So if you do work with other people, such as family, friends, doctors, district nurses, speech and language therapists, it's important that you work in a professional manner and show respect as you go along. We may have advocates that work alongside people and their people, maybe through lack of capacity or through ill health, where they've appointed somebody who's able to make decisions on behalf of somebody. Now, later on, you'll do some training around mental capacity and consent. It's important that we do involve family members in decision-making processes but let's not exclude the most important person from the decision, which is the customer. They should be at the centre of the decision-making process. And just because they may lack capacity doesn't mean that they're not allowed to be involved in the decisions that are being made about them. It's important you follow those and anything that you have concerns about, you report back. 
Again, it's important we work together to create personal centred care plans and we look at things around diets and food and fluid and choice and social activities. We're not experts in all fields and therefore it's important we involve more people into somebody's care to provide best possible outcomes. That only really works under effective partnership working if we move to our next C. So our first C was competency, our second C is now communication. It is important that we communicate in an effective manner. And I'm not going to move too much onto this because one of our standards is all about communication and we have an outcome in that alone. It's important that when we talk we avoid jargon because if we're using language in which people don't understand you're going to confuse them and cause frustration. Think about how you want to hear things, that's probably how the customer wants to hear it too. Sounding smart doesn't mean you're smart, it just causes confusion. You need to build trust with people because unless somebody trusts you, they're unlikely to open up and it's unlikely for that relationship to work. When you visit people in, the, in their own homes, you are in a position of trust. And again, you have to maintain that by communicating in an effective manner and by not lying to people. So for example, if we say to somebody, I'll only be a minute, then make sure it's only a minute. If you are unable to meet that minute, because for some reason you know you're really busy, don't lie to them, say I'll get back as soon as I can. So it's about thinking about our language skills, about the way that we say things to what's being interpreted. Again, we talk about respect, so it's important that we have to respect people as individuals. We may not agree with every choice that people make, but people are allowed to make unwise choices as part of their decision-making processes. It's our role to provide information, advice and guidance for them to make an informed decision and thus support them along the way. If you need further advice and support, we can get that from an array of places. It's called social signposting. What that means is we can use other third-party services such as charities and organisations to help meet people's needs. When you go out into people's homes, you will see lots of different things. The typical worries that most people go through is about how can they afford their care, their benefits and their housing. So it's useful for you to know what advice and support is local in where you could signpost people. Unless you're an expert, we shouldn't be giving advice. Now, we've come to the end of this module and what you'll see is what you should know. And as we move down, we've got some questions in which you'll need to answer. So question one looks at an activity and it says here, what are my main duties and responsibilities? So here, we want you to have a copy of your job description and we want you to tell us. And all you do is you can type into there or you can handle it. The second question looks at our code of practice and again, for you to find the code of practice, you'll need to go onto that website, in which we pointed out on the second page down, and again, you can write some of those codes of practices there. The third question looks at uh, being aware about your attitudes and beliefs, and give an example of what you do may affect other people. So here, I want you to think about something personal, something that you have a strong belief about, and how that will help or contribute into the care setting. And again, you can just write your example there. As we move down, you'll think about a negative, ex a negative, a negative experience and think about uh, what you've done. And it asks you to think about what you could have done differently. And that process is called reflective practice. And again, you'll cover that in another module later on. Look at something positive, have a little write about that. And again, think about your own personal beliefs. As we move down, it wants you to become familiar with your roles and responsibilities around health and safety. So at this point, you'll need to go online, read our health and safety handbook, read your health and safety policies and procedures, and then write about how that affects you in your role. Give an example of your understanding of confidentiality. So make sure you've read the confidentiality policy, the GDPR, uh, and the whistleblowing, so you understand when it's appropriate to break confidentiality. Think about your working times, so uh, have you looked at the working time directive, have you opted in or opted out, and again around your pay and wages understand what you're going to be paid and if you can document those there. As we come down, it's asking you to look at 
the company that you're working for's aims, it's asking you to look at their objectives and their values. And you will find those normally on the website. Now, each service has two key documents and legislation. The first one is the statement of purpose, and the other one is the service user's guide handbook. I guarantee that that answer for that unit for that will be in the statement of purpose and the service user's handbook. You just simply need to find those. This one, we're looking at agreed ways of working. So again, here you can just give the example of an agreed way of working. It might be around medication, it might be around moving and handling, it might be around care planning. Here, you've got a simple yes or no. So the health and safety, uh, the health and safety of staff is in danger. Would you report it yes or no? So this one you just simply mark. Here, we want you to think about um, when you would report something or when you would raise a concern or a whistleblow. So again, you should have read your whistleblowing policy and safeguarding policy to know how to answer that question. This one, we want you to take, uh, to think about your responsibilities and describe uh, four of the responsibilities of individuals. So again, you'll have four boxes so just think about what they are and again, jot those in there. Moving down, uh, I think we're coming towards the end here, uh, a working relationship and a personal relationship. So it's important we understand the differences between these two. Now you'll find those in the code of practice because the code of practice talk very much about boundaries and the fact that when we work in a professional relationship, we act in a certain way to the difference of us working in a personal relationship. So it's about you understanding the differences. And at the bottom, it just wants you to list some examples. Here, it's asking you for four main working relationships in health and social care. So again, we can talk about district nurses, doctors, family members, social workers, and just how you're going to work with those in the community. Here, we're looking about working with others. So again, it's essential to have good teamwork and partnership working, and it's asking you to, to explain how you're gonna do that. And then that's the end of your workbook. Now, when you type these in, you don't need to write war and peace. Sometimes less is more, um, then, then there's no word count to any of these. And if English isn't your first language and, and you're gonna find it difficult to write the content, Again, you can have somebody do this for you. Just, just put a note on there to say that you haven't done this, but you told somebody the answers. So I want to thank you for watching Standard 1 about understanding your roles and responsibilities. Please watch the other 14 standards and complete those workbooks. Thanks for watching.